I'm currently working as a tech lead of a team that is currently working on the Vardian for TypeScript feature of Vardian, which basically gives me the privilege that I can give you a, a quick sneak peek of Vardian 17 to see uh, what's coming in the future for Vardian. And the, the agenda for my presentation would be that I would try to answer two questions. First is like, why do we have Vardian 17 at all? And the second question, or the most of the time we will spend would be like, uh, I will take a look at what is uh, like a, one of the, actually one of the specific features in Volume 17, that is the client-side form. How could you build, how could you build a, a client-side form with type, type script and the data elements? So let's get started. First, this is really just a, a sneak peek of Volume 17. And uh, all the code or all the API I'm showing you during the presentation is based on body and 17 alpha. So the API might still change significantly. And uh, also on the other hand, it's a very good opportunity for you and like to take a look, try it out, voice your opinion out if you found something weird or not easy to use so that we can still like uh, update or change the API while we still can. Okay, and uh, the first question is, why do we have volume 17 at all? And if we actually go back a little bit earlier, some of you might uh, know, or most of you I assume would know that uh, starting from volume 17, uh, volume 15 already, we introduced this uh, volume for TypeScript feature. And uh, like, why do we have that feature at all in volume 15? Uh, why do we have that? Well, there are, two very difficult questions that uh, we as Vardian get from our customers from time to time. One is like, a, hey Vardian, do you support offline or how well do you support offline? And uh, how, how, how can I do a state, stateless application with Vardian? And the stateless here basically means the, the UI state on the server side. How can I make that a stateless? Well, no surprise, Vardian, basically don't really support that uh, while for offline, uh, starting with the PVE annotation, we can actually offer you a offline page for free, but uh, that's basically it. you don't get anything else out of the box. And regarding stateless, that's basically, we just uh, don't really support that because like a body is basically built on, on top of the philosophy that uh, the UI state is uh, stored on the server side uh, in the JVM. Yes, so that's like as I mentioned, that's like the the like the fundamental philosophy of Varian. Everything is in Java, in J in JVM. Like a, in the past, like twenty years, Varian has been doing one thing and one thing good. That is connect the uh, web with Java. So it's like a really convenient for the Java developers. They can uh, write their backend with Java. They can write their UI code with Java. Everything is Java running in the JVM. The benefit of this is that. Uh, they can, the UI and the backend, they can connect uh, seamlessly. And uh, well, the drawback is that uh, the previous two questions, like uh, people ask from time to time, you inevitably run into those questions in the end, if you uh, care about those. So starting from body 15, we provided uh, another alternative, like uh, just here, I want to emphasize that we are not replacing the later one with the previous one, just like we provide an additional, uh, uh, like a possibility to build your UIs. So in addition to the traditional way of building UI with Java, we provide a new way of building UI with uh, TypeScript so that your UI could run on the client side entirely, no server side components at all. And in this way, your UI is like uh, separated from the JVM and so that uh, it enables you uh, to uh, to build this kind of a stateless and a, uh, better offline support. And one thing I want to uh, again emphasize here is that uh, uh, still with Java, with Bonnie 15 Plus, with this TypeScript UI, we are still uh, like targeting the uh, mostly the Java developers because like we uh, it kind of works with uh, uh, Java backend at all. So. So it's like you get the most of it if you have a Java backend and the body will generate uh, the client-side TypeScript code and the uh, 
uh, market your service at and the point conveniently for you. So that uh, it just makes it much easier to use compare with if you build your UI with some other libraries and call the backend with the rest. So with volume 15, with this uh, type script UI, we get a much better offline support. Uh, like you can now run your uh, client side logic on the uh, on the in the browser on the client side, uh, most of them, and that's like much better than in uh, body fifteen. And also with state list, since now basically all the uh, UI state are running in the browser, not stored in the body session at all. So it's basically almost uh, stateless already. And also there is another frequently asked question is that hey. I want to scale up my Avani application. I want to use session replication. Is that uh, possible? Well, in the past, because or with the traditional Java UIs, uh, the UI state is basically stored in the uh, in the uh, body session, and the body session requires uh, locking. Basically, making session replication is uh, not very practical at all. But uh, starting from this uh, type of UI, if you build your UI entirely with type TypeScript, then nothing is really stored in the uh, body in session. So basically, then you can replicate, uh, make a session replication of your body application as any other application, uh, basically the same way. Yeah, so basically, this session replication is now finally unlocked with this TypeScript UI. The text is quite long, but you don't need to read all of them at this point. Just uh, it's better for, for you to read it offline. So enough said, let's take a look or take a comparison uh, between this Java UI and the TypeScript UI. What's the difference? What's the similarities? Here I have uh, two applications or oh, uh, like a, wait a minute. here it's like the demo is based on this start volume.com. And uh, if you haven't viewed this yet, I highly recommend you to take a look. So from this uh, start volume.com, here, like it's really a good point to get started of your body application. So it provides you uh, different views like a dashboard, or master details view, as well as some other view like a cut list, uh, uh, like form view, whatever. And for each view, you can select if you want the view to be Java only or with TypeScript or even with Java and uh, uh, like a Polymer template, but we won't cover this option for this uh, session, we will talk about this one and uh, compare this job only view on the TypeScript view. So I pre-downloaded the two applications. One is pure Java view, and the other is pure TypeScript view. And I have them running here in the application. And the first thing probably you will notice is that they look basically the same, which means that you can use either way to use your application. You can choose Java. If, most of your developers are Java developers. They are, we want to use Java, or you can use TypeScript uh, UIs if you, your developers like are more front end oriented and that you want a stateless and a better offline support. And then you can go to dashboard and they, like here, and also you can go to master details view up here. And uh, so that's like the similarities. Let's look at the difference. If we, open up this uh, Google Chrome developer tools, we look at the network tab and let's look at the network traffic. So for the Java view on the left side, if I select a row here in the grid, sorry, some initializing problem, let's clear everything. Now, if I just click a row, you see the request is sent to the server side. Again, if I select another row, another request is sent there. And also, if I change anything here in the form, if there's a value change the event, another request is sent there to the server side. And uh, for the TypeScript UI, everything like the network traffic here is actually very quiet. If I select a different roles, nothing happens here. And also, if I change the value, nothing really changes. There's no request. So everything happens on the client side. That's why you get. Uh, much better, uh, much better, uh, uh, like offline support with TypeScript UIs. Good. And uh, 
So that's basically why we built this uh, type of uh, body and for type, type of good feature in the first place, so that uh, to recap, so that the people can get better offline support and the people can uh, secure their body applications much better because of the, snows, the UI is now stateless on the server side. And uh, then, but if you start really start trying to build this uh, body in 15 or type of the UIs, you will find that, uh, uh, for example, one very common use case is uh, to use this form. Like uh, you might wonder how this uh, crowd UI or this form is implemented. And uh, if you take a look at the code, you will see that uh, when you load an item here, you're basically just copying the value uh, to the components here. The first name is the first name component here, and uh, also the last name. So you copy everything from the data to the component directly. And also when you save, you copy the value from the component into the uh, data and save it to the endpoint, things like that. So a lot of uh, a boilerplate code. And the body actually should do something uh, to help developers with that, like uh, on the server side, you have the binder, which allows you to bind the UI components to the uh, to the server side, uh, uh, like the data to your UI component automatically. But uh, that's not the case for body 15 type script UIs. And uh, we realized this kind of a limitation. That's why we started implementing this uh, uh, client side form features. Uh, uh, for for volume, and uh, that's why we have it in volume seventeen. And uh, you might be wondering, hey, why volume uh, seventeen? Why not sixteen? It's just because, uh, uh, like uh, here at the volume, we have this release train module where we will release a, a major release every three months, and uh, we simply didn't catch the uh, volume sixteen. A real stream, that's why the feature naturally comes to volume 17. Okay, that's basically why we had the volume for type, type feature in the first place and why we had this uh, uh, TypeScript or client side form feature in volume 17. And uh, let's now maybe start a live coding session to see what, what kind of APIs do we provide so that you can have a uh, client side form. And also, uh, please uh, keep your eyes open since it's, this is a live coding session and uh, you know the parameters tend to make uh, many stupid mistakes. I'm, I'm pretty sure I will do many of those. So please correct me if I do something stupid and uh, so I can uh, like uh, make it right in time. So here I have uh, downloaded the application, modified it a little bit. Uh, we will work on this master details view. And on the left side, we have this um, uh, browser window where you have this uh, 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 like a crowd view or master details view. And on the right side, I have my IDE open. And actually the first question people uh, normally ask is that uh, which IDE should I use for volume 15 or for the TypeScript UIs? So far, I found VS Code or Visual Studio Code is the best free IDE that uh, uh, I found so far. And you might ask, oh, oh why didn't I try any commercial uh, tools yet? Just because I'm cheap, I want to use free stuff if there's one. And also, I'm currently I'm pretty happy with VS Code, so I'm not kind of uh, willing to switch to another IDE yet. So if you are trying out what in, 15 or the type of the UI, so I also kind of recommend you try out the VS Code. And uh, so the first thing that you might notice that uh, in the master details view, when I here uh, select the different items in the grid, nothing really changes, so the form doesn't work at all. And also if I change anything and I click save, nothing happens. Also reset doesn't work at all, so nothing really works. Let's try to make it work. So the first thing to do is that uh, uh, you might be wondering, hey, I have this uh, binder on the server side. Do you have something similar on the client side as well? Well, let's give it a try. So let's uh, say uh, private binder equals new. 
Oh, yes, there is a binder class and uh, it requires two uh, parameters. One is this um, uh, context as the IDE uh, promotes you here, particularly where uh, the like this uh, form belongs to, that's like the lead element, you can just pass in this. The other is like the model. And for this one, uh, we are, uh, it's based on the employee uh, data and the uh, body automatically uh, actually generates you this uh, employee uh, model. And the model is something that like, uh, gives you the metadata of your uh, data. Uh, Oh, uh, first, uh, like a uh, first uh, demo effect happening today. It should automatically quick fix. Yes, import default one. Okay, good. But uh, anyway, that's like something to show you uh, uh, to show you as well. So uh, nowadays, IDE is a pretty smart. Like uh, uh, the first time I ran in this body fifty applications, I was kind of uh, uh, scared of all this kind of import. How do I import all this kind of stuff on the Java developer? I'm not familiar with that at all. But with IDE spot, we can actually uh, import those automatically for you. So now, uh, particularly for this binder, we have this element which is the context of this form and also the metadata for the like describing what kind of data you are uh, dealing with for the binder. And uh, the other thing you will notice that uh, I have the webpack running on in the backend and you see that the front and the compilation field basically it's saying that the binder is not used and uh, you can get you can ignore that of course and you can also just uh, uh, try to make the compiler happy by giving it a uh, TXE ignore and the, the uh, compiler will like uh, uh, compile just successfully everything will uh, turn green and you can also remove that later on if the binder would be used. So now we have uh, created our binder. The, the next step is how do we bind it into the, uh, into the field or into the components here. And then we have this editor layout and uh, let's see uh, for the data binding, we have this uh, special syntax in binding 17, uh, which is like this dot 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 equals and uh, here dollar sign at uh, 30 brackets and the field. And uh, so here, uh, just to explain you a little bit, this dollar sign square brackets, this is the syntax for uh, from lead element. And this field here is a, a special or a custom directive, again, just for the lead element. So that your uh, body can do something uh, or do the heavy work for you between the components and the lead binder. And uh, again, for the lead element syntax, we need something on the left side of the uh, equal operator uh, so that we kind of choose this dot, dot, dot uh, operator and for now, uh, because we didn't really find any other better options. And you can think of this dot, dot, dot as like a dot, dot, dot in English. Basically, just something you don't really need to care too much. And uh, the only thing you maybe want or you should care is like what kind of data or what, or where this uh, client side component should bind to. And you can do that with this dot uh, binder dot model dot uh, first name. Again, now it shows the benefit of using this module. It gives you all the metadata so that you can have this uh, uh, code complete or, or the complete feature there in your IDE so that you can avoid all the uh, string literals. Yeah, obviously it's a little bit slow and now you can, it can also import this uh, field directive automatically for you. And then once you have this, uh, first name, then you can basically just copy paste that into the last name and the email field as well. Yes, that's it. So now we have this binder and now we bind the UI components to our binder. 
what else do we need to do? First, let's like try to load the data into the uh, form. And here, uh, in inside this great event listener, when I select an item, this method will be caught. Uh, how do I set the data like this employee into the binder or into the form? There is this uh, thing called this .finder .reset, and you can pass in the data there and uh, you will see employee. And uh, then there is this, uh, like uh, if there's no value is selected, it needs to clear the binder or clear the form. How, how, how can I clear a form? Well, let's see what binder has. If you say here binder dot, you'll see there is actually a clear method there right for you. So you can just try to use that one. So much red. Okay, now it's, now it's all gone. Let's see, does it really work? Let's refresh the page and uh, figure it out. So now if I select the item, yeah, it shows there into the form. And also if I deselect a row here in the grid, it's cleared out. So I just needed to, how many lines of code did I write? Create a binder and bind it uh, here into the component and uh, load the data with binder.reset. Clear is a form with binder.clear. That's all I need for this uh, data loading to work. And uh, then what's next? We have this save and uh, reset. Let's see uh, how can I get that implemented. Well, well, I will just try to use IDE and this auto complete to see what kind of feature do I get from this binder. And uh, here I have this submit to. So when you save the data, you need to uh, tell the binder where the data that that should be uh, submitted to or how to handle that. Conveniently, we have uh, this uh, view and point here for each must like in this master details view, we have this view and point. Yes, it's here like, uh, it's again like this uh, automatically generated uh, client side and the point for you, this is like auto generated code. You don't need to worry that too much. And uh, there is also just a save employee method. I can just do that. And uh, let's see. Now it's at least uh, the, uh, well, like the web pack is happy. Let's see if everything works. So I do like that and I change the value and I say, hmm, it doesn't work. Actually, the value here is still the same. Well, let's see. Actually, if I refresh the page, you see the value is actually updated already. It's just that didn't show on the UI. And uh, some of you, if you are familiar with this uh, grid, you might know that uh, actually this grid has this uh, clear cache method that you need to use that uh, to be able to tell the grid, okay, so now the data provider is updated. Uh, try to refresh uh, the UI. Let's see if it helps or not. And uh, let's try another one, run through again. Hmm, still doesn't work. And if we refresh, it actually shows here as well. Well, now the problem is actually that uh, when we are submitting uh, to the server site, it will call the endpoint on the server site to actually save your data. It's actually a, an asynchronous call. So by nature, you would have to await for the result. And uh, since now you are waiting for using a wait, you need to use a sync as well for the save. This is just like the nature of the TypeScript, how do you do the asynchronous course? And now if we refresh the page and I have one, two, let's change it to one, three and uh, save. Yeah, now it works. You see here it's updated to one, three immediately. And uh, so just by using two lines of code, I got the save function now working. How about the reset? Well, after working, like uh, three months from home, I really appreciate this reset, reset function because I have a four years uh, boy at home with me and he always uh, tries to mess up with my computer. So let's say if I, or if he accidentally 
type something uh, random stuff here, I want to actually uh, be able to reset it to the previous state. What I could do here is that, uh, oh, let's see what kind of a method finder could provide me. Okay, actually it has this reset. Let's see if it works. Okay, so now I have this one. Let's try this one and uh, let's say my son came here and they type something randomly. And he, by the way, I just noticed this email field probably pointed to the wrong field. Yes, in that way, so it should be email, not, uh, not last name. Yeah, let's assume again my son came here and do some mess up with my record in the form. What I can do is that I can just click the reset. Now everything is back to the uh, previous state. Yes, so to summarize, what, what did I do to make this form work? First, I created the binder and also I can remove this yes it's no now because now the binder is used. And uh, also like the ID will import all this kind of uh, stuff automatically for me. And then I just bind the, uh, bind the uh, UI components to the binder uh, model, copy that, copy paste that uh, three times. And then for the sake of loading the data, I just call this um, or that uh, binder of reset or binder of clear. And for save, I can just say binder that sum me too. And uh, then for the reset, I just call like a uh, binder of reset. So I think at this point, all the APIs they are, are quite uh, straightforward. So what do you think? Let us know in the questions uh, section. Yes. And uh, what's next? Uh, what's next? Like uh, we can do well. And now we get the loading and saving the data works. Oh, actually, there's one more thing that I forgot to show you. You might be wondering, hey, uh, do I need to pass this endpoint uh, callback all the time? Could it be I just call some each somehow? Actually, you can do that. Uh, so that um, uh, I'll move it earlier. So when you creating this binder, there is also another option, uh, like some optional parameter you can uh, configure what to do when you like on some meet, and uh, you can pass in that I want to uh, call the view endpoint to save employee, and then actually when you save that one, you can instead of calling some meet too, you can just call uh, some meet. It also works just kind of another way of doing that in case you need to call some new two, uh, like uh, more than once. See, so I have this one and I have this, let if I update it into one four, yes, it still works. So that's all you need to do to load and save the data. And the next topic, let's move on to validation. It's very, very rare if you, like a beautiful form without any validation. And uh, currently we don't have uh, any validation added here at all. And the, the first thing that uh, uh, like uh, people might think is that uh, in button 14 or button 8, we have this uh, awesome bin validation where on the server side bin or entity, for example, here we have this employee and I can just add some annotations here uh, validation annotation to the different fields and they go, I can use a bin validation, uh, bin validation binder to, uh, to get it work like with these annotations. That's body 15 or that's body 17. The client side form also support this feature. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see that uh, we would require all the three fields to be non empty. And we, of course, have this uh, not empty annotation here from the validation library and we just show you that one. First name, last name, and also email. And then let's see, let's go back to the master details view. Do I need to uh, switch this binder? Where is that one? To the invalidation binder? No, actually you don't. That's all. You only need to add those validations for the bean. Everything else, but it takes care of, takes care for you. So as soon as you add those uh, validations, uh, 
use. The first thing you will notice is that here you have this require indicator already. So if it's not empty, obviously it requires a value. And if you try to uh, like uh, navigate away from this field, you get the validation error automatically. So that's all for the like building validations or for the being validations. You just need to add validations annotation there and then nothing else while the uh, client side form binder takes everything else uh, for you. And uh, then you might wondering, hey, it, like, uh, do you support adding validator only on the server side? Can I add a validator on the client side as well? Well, yes, actually you can do that. And uh, to do that, please drop in the first update method, which is a callback of lead element. Let's say you can uh, add a validator to a different module like this, this dot binder dot four. And uh, let's say we want to add it to the, uh, the first name field and uh, we want to uh, add a validator. We want to add a validator to validate that uh, uh, like, oh, sorry, not this one. Actually, we want to add a, a building validator, let's say size validator. And uh, the mean value should be four or five. There should be at least uh, five uh, characters there. And so that, so that is important automatically for me. Nice green and there should be fine. And of course, I can also pass in a message here to say what, what to show to the user if. Uh, uh, at least uh, five characters required. Let's say like that. And if we refresh and uh, we try type one, and you see you get the error message immediately at least five letters required. And as soon as, as I keep typing, there are more than five letters, then uh, it, the error message goes away. And if I uh, like uh, delete some of the letters, now I get the error message again. So uh, like uh, on the client side, currently Vadin 17 provides you all the uh, built-in validators that you get from the server side, uh, uh, like annotation validation, like not empty, not null, a size, and uh, not blank, and many other things that you can think of. They are all inside this uh, body and well, that's this body and form uh, package. But anyway, the ID will import all this automatically for you. So that's the built-in validators. Uh, you might be wondering, hey, how about some custom validators? I have my <coughs> own very special validator, not the one I want to uh, like uh, use from the uh, like all this uh, standard or built-in validators. Let's see if there is something that we can do. And uh, so instead of passing a building validator, you can pass in a custom validator, which implements this uh, validator interface. It requires two uh, properties, one in this validator function. Uh, for example, let's say that uh, we can validate the value to be what is that, uh, includes body. Yeah, if it if the name has this secret word by and let's just make it invalid. And also you can pass in the uh, message. Uh, you, you are using the secret word like that. Yeah, now the web pack is happy again. Let's see. I refresh the page and I started typing. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, but as soon as I started using body, yeah, I got this uh, uh, aromatic again. So you can basically, in this way, you can pass in all your custom validators as long as you pass in this, uh, uh, pass in a valid function which returns a true or false, a Boolean value and also a message to tell like what to show to the user. And uh, then there is, um, uh, that's 
I think that's really awesome already. But uh, uh, some people have the use case like uh, I need to have this uh, uh, cross field validator, like uh, the name, the validation, uh, valid kind of uh, the validity of a field or for the first name depends on um, the value from another field. For example, we could have a validator saying that the first name and last name, they should not be the same that uh, in case user made some mistakes. How can we do that? Well, one challenging work for this kind of validator is that uh, actually when that validation fields were uh, to show the uh, validation error message, for example, do you want to show that for the uh, first name field or for the second, for the last name field or whatever? And the body also supports that as well. Uh, but before we are doing that, I noticed some duplicated work, uh, like the code here, it's binder model first name. It's used uh, two times already. Let's exchange that into a constant uh, as a first name. Okay, now I have this first name module. Let's try to add a uh, cross field validator. A cross field validator basically is something that uh, you can add to the binder itself, you not know, to a specific field. And uh, what you can do here is that uh, again, you just add a validator. And uh, now it also requires a validate function. And uh, let's say it's, you validate a value and you return some error message. And then you have this uh, error message. Uh, let's say that. Uh, it should be like a day first name. And the last name should do not uh, be the same. And the thing that uh, now we just cross with valid validator, as I mentioned, you need to specify where actually to show the validation error message. And uh, let's say if the uh, value dot first name uh, equals value of last name, say like that they do match what to do. And you need to return some uh, error message. Of course, now it doesn't really work if you just return this message itself, but instead you can return a structure. And the first thing that uh, you can return a property, basically it indicates where actually to show the uh, error message. We can say that to show it to the first name, so whenever like the two value, they are the same. Uh, we just show the as error message under the first name field. And uh, the second one is like the value. So we can just pass in the value itself. And the third one is the validator. And the validator, we can just uh, uh, return this like that. And uh, then, I think that's it. It's not happy. Let's see. Oh, yes. Sorry. It uh, should be like this validator. Yes. Yeah, it needs uh, uh, three different properties. Uh, second one is actually value and the passing value. And you can uh, just pass the value itself uh, directly. Let's see what happens now. My ID is not happy, but. Uh, Oh, now it's happy as well. Let's, let's refresh the page. And uh, I have this two fields. Now I type here, whatever, maybe A, A, B, C, D, E. Let's say under the last name, let's say uh, A, B, C, D, E. And as soon as they started matching and the, you get the validation error message on the uh, first name field. And uh, then if you started typing now they don't match. You have the uh, first uh, the validation error message is gone. So that's basically how you do the cross field validation. And uh, the only difference compared with the previous one that uh, uh, you ought like maybe two different uh, uh, things. Firstly, that the validator is added to the binder, so it's a record level validator. And the second thing is that uh, instead of just to return a boolean, we return a Kind of a different structure where you can specify actually where to display the error message. So that's for the validation or for the validator. 
uh, let's see, I have still some minutes left and uh, uh, let's see if we can still improve this uh, form a bit uh, a bit further. So the one more thing you might notice that we have this reset and save button. The thing is that uh, the reset button is always enabled even though you didn't modify the uh, value in any way yet. And also the save button, of course, you don't want the user to be able to save uh, if the form is invalid, but it's enabled also always. And uh, what can we do? First, let's find out where are the two buttons. Here is the reset, here is the save. And uh, actually we can say that what we want to do is that uh, we know there's a disable, uh, disabled and uh, here I bind somehow dollar sign of course and uh, actually we have this binder but uh, 30 and then we want to disable that of course uh, when the form is uh, not 30. Yeah let's see if it works. Now we have this one yeah you see now the reset button is disabled uh, it's only enabled once you uh, make some modifications of course you can Disable that, now the button is uh, disabled again. All you need to do is just to bind this disabled property into this uh, dirty property from binder. And also you might be wondering is disable this, uh, and also the question mark is just the syntax from the element when you are trying to bind something into the uh, Boolean property. And we can actually do something similar for the save button. And we can say that it should be disabled when the Finder is uh, uh, invalid. Let's refresh. Oh. Yes, let's refresh and. Uh, oh, sorry, not. It should be invalid, not, not in, in invalid. And now it's like uh, the field is, uh, the save button is enabled. And uh, once I like remove the first field, it's uh, started to be. Uh, invalid and not the save button is uh, uh, disabled. So that's like uh, another convenient uh, API that uh, we provide for you in button 17. You can just uh, uh, like uh, bind this kind of a property into your form state uh, declaratively with one line of code. So that's basically all the kind of the cool features I want to share with you for the client side form. And uh, I know at this point, uh, some people might be uh, wondering, okay, that's pretty cool, but uh, but I'm a little bit worried is body actually moving away from Java. Are you like focusing on the TypeScript or the scary TypeScript or the Java, JavaScript stuff? Uh, are you dropping us as Java developers? Actually, to answer this question, maybe we take a look at the team composition. And uh, for the uh, team that is building for this body for TypeScript feature, we have uh, three developers, including me and uh, a product owner. And uh, we also have this Flow team, which is uh, working on the uh, traditional Java UI functionalities. And as you can see, it's, uh, there's uh, much more developers um, or many more developers there. We have like eight developers together with a product owner. So that team is much uh, bigger than uh, our team. And uh, that's also mean that uh, body, the main focus for, for body is still for the uh, Java, Java developers or the Java functionalities. Good. And uh, I think so far that's I shared everything already. And uh, then there are some links. Uh, for example, for the demo, you can get from GitHub. Everything is there. You can try it out to see if uh, everything works for you or if you found something weird. And if you do find something weird or you, require, you have some feature request, you can go to our uh, GitHub, but in GitHub is uh, like a, a Git, uh, repo for the platform. You can put it there and we will figure out where to put that uh, into a cracked uh, sub repos. So yes, uh, I highly, highly recommend that if you are interested in this uh, client-side form, uh, please try it out and uh, report us some bugs or whatever feature requests so that we can uh, improve our APIs at this alpha phase while we still can. I think that's all from me. Sorry, I think I'm running like almost two minutes late. 
hopefully you don't mind. And uh, I can move that on into the uh, Q&A session if you have any. So we have some interesting questions there. Okay, is there any plan to support offline capability in pure Java? Uh, would it be possible to automate the generated ES from uh, uh, from Java? I can partially answer this, this question. We have the offline support for the from the TypeScript uh, side. Uh, we have it on our roadmap already. We will try to uh, make that possible already this year. But for the uh, pure Java one, I don't think it's on the roadmap. And uh, so, yeah, now it goes to it not. Would it be possible to automate the generation of the TS from Java? Yes, the generation uh, of the TS uh, from Java, it's kind of already automated, like everything's generated automatically for you, so you don't need to do anything there at all. I think the first question could be marked as uh, answered. Now we have the second one. And my question is similar to the previous question. Will Bodin continue to support developing with pure Java for a long term? Yes, as, as I mentioned already in the presentation, I know many people have these concerns. I can again assure you that uh, currently the major focus is still on the Java side. We have a much bigger team uh, focusing on the flow team and uh, it's a relatively smaller team for us to work on the uh, TypeScript features. And this one could be marked as answered, I think. And then there's a third one. Is it possible to use lead element with type, TypeScript instead of a uh, traditional polymer template with JavaScript? Yes, actually it is. Uh, sorry, I didn't make it as clear. All the code I show you during the uh, live coding session is actually with uh, using TypeScript together with lead element, not uh, polymer templates. Actually, that's like the way to go with uh, this type of TypeScript UI. And with volume 15, I think started volume 15 already. If you want to build type, types with the UI study for this using the uh, lead element. Thanks. And this could be marked as answered. And uh, okay, there's another one. Is it possible to combine client and server side validation? Personally, I don't trust any input coming from the client. Yes, and uh, I, yeah. Okay, good. This is from Novi again. Thank you, Novi. Has he has been helping me for some like a production security issues in the past. And uh, yes, actually, I didn't read all the full uh, question, but uh, you can actually uh, combine both client side and server side uh, validators, as I showed you basically during the presentation. Uh, the not empty validation is actually from the server side, and the other validations. Digital are, are from the client side. You can, uh, when there's uh, validation errors, you can actually try catch the error and do something yourself. Uh, like the validation from the server side will also be part of the uh, the error, so you can uh, handle it from there. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's part of the feature. Yes, and then there's another question. You showed how field level validation worked out of the box for a module. Uh, uh, for a module, does Spotting 17 support custom field level and the class level validation? Uh, well, the class level validation or the record le level validation I just uh, showed you during the uh, live demo uh, session, you can just add a validator to the uh, to the binder and the, uh, to the first name and last name, they should match. And uh, that's kind of the uh, class level validation. Yes, we support that very well. And this is part of the core features. And uh, does Vadian 17 support uh, custom, custom field? Uh, yes, uh, let's say that so we try to support, but uh, we have a ticket which like a, a custom converter. I think for custom field, you need to set from convert to convert the UI value into the, uh, into the, uh, into the data and also uh, uh, vice versa. And uh, yes, I think if we have time, we will make that already for body 17. If not, it might come in body 18. But anyway, that will be part of the client side form feature. And uh, for the class level validation, we have it already, as uh, I showed you during the live coding session. 